we're going to move on to Mr. Phillips' presentation. Mr. Phillips, thank you for joining us today.
three stages of fracking, you know, where you, you go down and you blast the fissures and then you send in a high pressure mixture of sand, which is the actual fracking process that the industry will talk about. Then you extract the gas through either pumping or natural pressure. And water is critical to fracking. Uh, there's five stages of it. First, you've got to get the water, and some, sometimes we're talking about 14 million gallons of water or barrels of water for, per well. Then you have to mix the chemicals, then you inject the wells, then you produce the flow back water, and then you have to get rid of the wastewater. And of course, that's a big thing everybody's talking about right now. But I want to point out that uh, in New Mexico, we have four of the 12 major geologic provinces in the, in the United States. And I don't know another state that can claim that, but we have three major basins. The Colorado Plateau is, is where the San Juan Basin is up in the northwest. The Great Plains is where the Permian Basin is. And then we have the Basin and Range, which is where we're standing right now, the middle Rio Grande Basin, also called the Albuquerque Basin. Now, there's prolific oil and gas production in the San Juan Basin and, and the, and the, and the um, Permian Basin. However, there's no oil and gas production in the Middle Rio Grande Basin. And that's a direct relatable reason is because of the amount of faulting that occurs. If you look at the cross sections of the uh, San Juan Basin up at the top there, which it looks like on the subsurface, you don't see a lot of faults. When you look at the Permian Basin, same, same type of structure, but when you look at the Albuquerque Basin, you have all those black lines, those are faults. <clears throat> Tremendous faults. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the, the age of these basins. They're very different. This is a, cro a stratigraphic cross-section. The oldest rocks are at the bottom, the youngest at the top, all the way to the present time. The oldest basin is the Permian Basin, 299 million years ago. Then uh, uh, about 171 million years later, the San Juan Basin formed. You can see it up here, this is the formation. And here, here's the Wolf Camp Shale, which they're fracking. And the San Juan Basin, that's the Mango Shale, which they're fracking. And then the third basin, of course, is the youngest, which started 26 million years ago, and has two stages. But the point is that it's still active. It's still forming, okay? So you have three different basins with three different geologic provinces, three different ages, three different tectonic histories, and three different burial histories. Therefore, you've got three different sets of data pertaining to oil and gas exploration. Three different sets. So it is improper to compare the Permian Basin to the Middle Rio Grande Basin, or the San Juan Basin to the Middle Rio Grande Basin. All right, so in nearly a century of oil and gas operations in New Mexico, there has never been a conventional commercial field discovered in the middle of Rio Grande Basin, and there probably never will be. And let me tell you why. Because the middle Rio Grande Basin is part of the Rio Grande Rift, as Eddie mentioned to you. And the, the, this, this mark here is the, this is the middle Rio Grande Basin, and superimposing, you can see where the, excuse me, this is the Rio Grande Rift, and you can see where the middle Rio Grande Basin fits into the Rio Grande Rift. Um, this is one of only four active continental rifts in the world. The other three, uh, the East African Rift, the Lake Baikal Rift in Russia, and the West Antarctic Rift. And the fourth one, of course, is our own Rio Grande Rift. And it's the only one in North America, only one in the United States. Very, very unique geology. It needs to be taken into account. Um, because it's in the Basin and Range province, uh, where geology was formed by extension or pulling apart, where you get basins and, and uplifts and things like that, which is basically, if you look at the Sandia Mountains, that's an uplift, a little bit associated with the uh, Basin and Range province. This is the formation of the Rio Grande Rift. And you see it started with one fault, and then it started pulling apart, and this is what we have today. This is what the geology in the subsurface looks like. Now, what, what are the characteristics of, uh, of an active continental rift? First of all, you have major faults throughout that cut the basement. The basement are the granitic rocks that are seen right here that sedimentary rocks overlay on. And if you look at the Sandia Mountains, you can see 
layers of rock, those are the sedimentary rocks, and the rock below it is granite. It's the basement. It's been popped up that far. Okay, so you have all of these faults throughout the basin, and these provide conduits or a pathway for the upwelling of fluids. Uh, also, you have uh, another major uh, characteristic is reactivation of existing faults. Because the rift is still forming, the faults are still moving. And as you dump more sediment in there, it puts more weight on it and moves the faults. So what you have is seismic activity. And the United States Geological Survey says for New Mexico, the area that is home to more earthquakes than any other region in the Rio Grande, that is the Rio Grande, is the Rio Grande Valley between Socorro and Albuquerque. And New Mexico Tech states, because of the large number of active faults in the Rio Grande Rift, the probability of a future large earthquake in the rift is significant. And here's from that paper, basically shows uh, from New Mexico Tech, the amount of seismicity from 69 to 2008 of magnitude greater than 2.0. Um, and you can see the cluster around the Rio, middle Rio Grande Basin. But also, one of the things it said in here was that uh, there are some clusters of seismic events, which are earthquakes, were induced by fluid withdrawal or injection in oil and gas field wells. That is a result of fracking in the Permian Basin. And also, there's been a new report up in the, the Raton Basin by the University of Colorado, which Part of the Raton Basin is in New Mexico and Colorado, and they document fracking as a result of hydraulic fracking. They document earthquakes. So what does active mean? What does this active continental rift mean? Well, it means that the middle Rio Grande Basin is not stable. Not stable like the Permian Basin, and not stable like the San Juan Basin. It means that its existing faults are subject to frequent movement, you have increased seismicity, more vulnerable to earthquakes, and that the faults continue to move so the fault fill is, is lacking. You know, and these aren't annealed, they're not full, so it allows fluids to move along. So it, what we're saying is the San Juan Basin is tectonically stable, but it's not an active seismic zone. Fracking is going on there now. We're saying that the Permian Basin is tectonically stable, active uh, fracking going on now. But the middle Rio Grande Basin is unstable. It's a seismic zone. And we haven't started fracking yet. Hopefully, we need to really think about whether we want to do that. And it basically, you know, what it means is that you really have to think hard about allowing fracking in a tectonically unstable seismic zone. Why? Because we already know that fracking causes earthquakes. And the process of fracking causes earthquakes. And this is happening in tectonically stable basins. Thanks to fracking, earthquake <coughs> hazards in parts of Oklahoma are now comparable to California. Earthquakes are comparable to California and Oklahoma. And here's a, this is from a Forbes article in 2016, and it shows when fracking really took off with the shale places and the different shale plays, compared it to the amount of earthquakes that have occurred associated with that. It's one to one. Nobody doubts this now. Nobody doubts it, not even in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and here, here are some photographs of Pictures of earthquake damage in non in tectonically stable areas: Ohio, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, confirmed to be associated with the process of fracking. Now, the oil and gas companies will tell you that you know that you have layers of of, of uh, your your water layers are up at the top, and you, you go a thousand feet above where they frack. The shales. And that's true in the San Juan Basin, and that's true in the Permian Basin. But let's remember that earthquakes occur near faults. And what they're doing in, in these other basins is when they drill these injection wells, they hit these faults, and that causes the earthquakes. But we also now know that the actual process of fracking causes earthquakes. And that's confirmed by the Journal of Geophysical Research. 
and a number of studies around the world, not just the United States. Okay, so if earthquakes occur near faults, what happens if you frack in an active seismic zone? What if that, which is what the oil and gas companies say it looks like here, looks like this, which is really what it, it looks like. And what you have are the shales here that are highly faulted. And anywhere you drill, anywhere near those faults, because you're in an active seismic zone, if you, if you do a fracking job out there, you're going you're to cause an earthquake. So, what happens if you go down and you hit something like you track, track the Manca Shale across one of these faults and you're anywhere near the reservoir? You're going to have an earthquake? What's that going to do? Extensive fracking in the middle of Rio Grande Basin creates a virtual certainty, certainty for induced earthquakes. Well, what happens if you do that near Cochiti Lake or in subdivisions near Rio Rancho or businesses in Bernalillo? And uh, so we've got two dangers. One is earthquakes. The other one is contamination of drinking water. Now, why is this important? Because we're in the Rio Grande Rift. And the Santa Fe Group drinking water aquifer was dumped into the Rio Grande Rift. So the rift controls everything. And I'm showing you several maps here that are from US geological studies. This, this rift. And this water aquifer has been studied extensively by the United States Geological Survey. There's all kinds of information out here. And basically, you've heard people say that basically we have a, a sandbox below us, which is where the water is. Well, that's a pretty good analogy, actually. Because you can see that the, the maps of the Rio Grande water, the water aquifer parallel the Rio Grande Rift. The river is there because of the rift, not the other way around, okay? You had this low area and it drained, drained all the water from it, okay? And as you move south from Sandoval County, everything gets deeper, and there are plenty of cross-sections that show that as well. It's just more expensive if they're going to frack down closer to Albuquerque. Magna Shale in the base of the tertiary water aquifer. Here's a cross-section, and it shows Rio Rancho, Bernalillo, Placidas, that black is the mango shale, and in many cases, it's in direct contact with the water off. And I, I just popped this in because I want, I want everybody to understand that this is, these are scientific facts. It's been heavily studied. The SGS broke out uh, our water aquifer into nine different groups, and the uh, layers four, five, and the upper part of six is where most of the groundwater usage occurs. And they broke it out into nine different areas, and they basically proved that that water goes horizontally and vertically down downstream. Uh, there was a study done in the Rio Rancho, Sandoval County for Rio Rancho uh, Estates when they were looking at the water there in May 2013. They were saying, "What should we should we develop this?" Sandoval County did this, commissioned this study. Should we build this one development? And what it said was that after 25 years with no development, you're going to have drawdown up there in the upper left that affects not only Sandoval County, but Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. And if you build this thing out, 25 years full build out, it extends even farther for individual wells and municipal wells. If you look at 100 years uh, and build that whole thing out, then the drawdown in the water aquifer extends all the way down into Valencia County. The point being that the Middle Rio Grande Basin has one large continuous water aquifer. Water flows downhill, and if you pollute the water aquifer system, the contamination will flow downstream. And that means that if, if, uh, if fracking is allowed, up in Sandoval County, and the water aquifer is polluted there, then that polluted water is going to flow downhill into Bernalillo County, and eventually Valencia County. Um, and my point here is that if you allow fracking in this basin, it's a virtual certainty you're going to screw up the water aquifer in some form. Um, water aquifers are above the fracked shale. They're not impacted in the Permian Basin and the San Juan Basin. But in 
What if that looks like this? What if you actually have the shale in contact with the water aquifer? Which is what we have here in this basin. You can see it's basically the same thing. If you, if you go down and you frack the bank of shale and you cause e even an earthquake, or you're going you're gonna to impact the water aquifer. You're going to contaminate it. And so there's two, two things. Well, what, what can contaminate the middle of the river and drinking water aquifer? The first is the fracking chemicals. You know what they put in these fracking chemicals? And you know, now the uh, EPA did a study and then Yale followed it up. They found over a thousand chemicals nationwide that are being used. Many of them are petroleum chemicals. And many are hazardous to human health. So you have to ask yourself, why do they put all these chemicals in there? Why? Well, and the other major thing is um, that can contaminate the middle Rio Grande drinking water aquifer is gas from the fracked shales because it all doesn't come back up the well bore. What happens is, I mean, here's gas flurry from the San Juan Basin near Chaco Canyon. Gas is a byproduct of hydrocarbon drilling, whether you're drilling normal vertical wells or unconventional hydraulic fracking wells. And look at some of the places around the country where water aquifers has been, have been contaminated in stable basins with no seismic activity previously. Here's in Pennsylvania, very famous, Colorado, Texas. And the truth is that it's happening around the world. And now, to try to get this through, in my mind, that fracking in the middle Rio Grande Basin is like playing Russian roulette with all the chambers loaded. If you pull the trigger, you're going to cause earthquakes. And the first thing that you're going to feel are the earthquakes in Rio Rancho, if they're allowed to start fracking up there on that acreage up there that they're talking about, then you're going to find that the aquifer is going to be contaminated, but it's going to take longer to do that. It's a virtual certainty this is what's going to happen. And the point being is that you just cannot go lightly into allowing fracking in the middle Rio Grande Basin because it's an active seismic zone. So if if fracking now causes earthquakes in non-active seismic zones around the world, and it's being prohibited around the world now, Ohio actually stopped fracking because they thought earthquakes would only be caused by the injection wells. But that's not true. They were getting earthquakes from just a normal process of fracking. And that's in a non-active seismic zone. And around the world, people are finding that earthquakes are being caused by fracking. And it's, this is just a fact. And it needs to be mentioned. It needs to be discussed. It's so important for you all to understand this. And I'm sorry I'm so passionate about this, but when I read the report, I kept thinking to myself, well, they're missing too much, so I've got to do something. So, you know, based on what my, my friend asked me to do, I couldn't just stop by recording things. So what I decided to do was act as a consulting geologist. And if you had come to me and asked me, to write up guidelines for the oil and gas industry uh, ordinances in the middle Rio Grande Basin. This is what I would put together. And I have a report here I want to leave with you. And in this report, it, it not only includes what I've shown you here today, but it, it also includes a, um, a template for an ordinance for the entire middle Rio Grande Basin. This ordinance would, basically, all you have to do is fill in the name of your community. It would allow vertical drilling, conventional drilling, oil and, for oil and gas, but it would prohibit hydraulic fracking and a horizontal drilling. Because we, we've had lots of wells drilled in here by vertical, and Shell did a lot of, a lot of testing back in the 70s and 80s, and I, would, I, I studied that. And, and I, can, I can tell you that there's a reason that the big companies aren't in here. Because you're not going to get uh, conventional oil and gas fields discovered in this basin. It's just not possible because it's, it, they are late structures. Okay? Also in here is, is, a, uh, is a, uh, 
a legal study written by Peter A. Dang, who was a brilliant lawyer and had a lot to do with crafting this ordinance as well. And it basically will give you a different opinion about whether or not you can actually prohibit hydraulic fracking in the middle Rio Grande Basin, which I believe you can and you must. So uh, with that, I want to thank you again for the, for the presentation. And I don't want to get too riled up, but I really appreciate you allowing me to take the time to explain this, because it's so it's just so important for you to understand this. Okay. Well, before you step back, uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, let me ask the uh, the members here if there are any questions before you step away okay. on the presentation. Yes, Member Gibson. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was really, really informative. Um, so you said something right there at the last. That the, the reason that uh, Big Oil is not here right now represented because there's a, um, not a, an economic reason for them to be here is what I heard. And and I'm wondering, well, why why are they getting so much uh, oil and gas out of, out of the Permian Basin in the southwest part of the, of the uh, well, state then? The Permian Basin is very different from the Middle Rio Grande Basin. Okay? Okay. The Middle Rio Grande Basin, and you know, I was an exploration geologist and an exploration manager. And the reason that they're not here is because they drilled wells to check it out. And they did seismic lines to shoot it. And they know that this basin is, is still forming, which means all of the structures that were formed were formed light. Okay? So you, when you, when you, one of the things you look for in, in oil and gas uh, exploration is the migration timing of the oil and gas. You know, the shale is put down, and then with pressure and temperature and time, and temp, you know, it, it basically starts to produce the oil, and then there's a time when the oil migrates. Okay. Well, the oil migrated, and if you have structures, you know, like a, an anticline, the oil will migrate into these structures. Well, the structures have to be there first, right? Well, in the Middle Rio Grande Basin, the structures formed after oil migrated. So, if you're going to drop a twenty-five million dollar well in the exploration, your probability of success is less than 5% to find anything that's commercial. Because the oil's gone already. The structures form afterwards. They're called lake structures. But in the San Juan Basin and in the Permian Basin, you have early structures that caught the oil and gas migration. And they weren't fractured up later. You see what I'm getting at? And this is what Shell and the other major oil companies found, that there's no, no way that you're going to find vertical you know, find commercial fields by drilling vertically. Now, one of the things the oil and gas industry is saying, well, you can have a secondary target, you know, for this or that, but that's, I just don't think that's a probability that it's, it's worthwhile. Why they're really pushing it is because they want another place to go to frack these shales. And the shales contain the hydrocarbons, okay? They frack them, and then they pull them up out of the well. And there's still a lot of doubt whether or not the shales here are uh, mature enough to have produced enough oil and gas. So the real problem is, whatever you do, if you allow fracking in this basin anywhere near faults, and there are faults everywhere, you're going to cause earthquakes, in my opinion. And you're going to you're going to endanger the water off. Seriously endanger. Did I answer your question? Yes. So um, when when in, I lived in the state of Colorado when I was in high school in the uh, late 60s, and they were uh, drilling for uh, oil shale back then. And we were having frequent tremors. Uh, I lived uh, in Westminster, which is just the northern suburb of Denver. And uh, yeah, I still live in Denver. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you remember that? Do you remember I do the remember rumors? that. I was working there, not in the 60s, maybe the 70s. And the 80s. I don't know when they stopped, but it was definitely in the <coughs> 60s. They didn't have the fracking technology back then, and they didn't have the horizontal wall bore. So what they were doing was they were drilling straight down, and they were trying to frack, and they, they, they didn't have the technology to get enough enough oil and gas out of there. So they, they basically stopped. Now they go horizontally, and the technology is so advanced 
with the explosions that they use and how far they can go in. It's incredible what they can do down there. And that's why they're pushing this. And, and here's another thing to keep in mind, and that is when you, in exploration in the old days, when you drill a, a well, you, you have an average probability of success for a commercial field of 20%. 20% for conventional drilling. When you drill today, in some place like the Permian Basin, horizontally and frack, your probability of success is greater than 95%. It's almost a sure thing. So what you're seeing is the oil and gas industry looking at the middle Rio Grande Basin as a potential for a whole new area of frack. But they're not taking into account, in my view, all of the facts that they need to which includes the disaster that might happen if they're allowed to frack in an area that is very active near a population. Remember O'Malley? Yeah, what I get from, from the presentation and, and some of the other, um, if you did the presentation earlier, is the importance of being proactive uh, about uh, making sure that, um, you know, the basin is, is will not be contaminated. In other words, to protect the basin as much as possible. And I, I certainly understand that. If we don't have clean drinking water, we don't have a community. That's the bottom line. Um, just on a smaller scale, um, because I, I think what's happening too is that, of course, the industry is producing, um, you know, it's a, it's a big windfall for the state in terms of money. We're a poor state. It employs a lot of people. As I said, their coffers have really been full of the state because of the industry. And just on a smaller scale, I, I was recalling that when I first started doing work in the sawmill community, um, there were reports of pollution from the particle board manufacturing company, which is no longer there. And um, we had to set out to prove that there was um, air emissions coming from this plant. And we got a lot of pushback because this was a company that was um, employing quite a number of people, over 100 people, and they were well paid. And, um, and that's what happens with communities, is that you get pitted between what you call the economic benefits of something and uh, concerns over health and welfare and, and pollution, things like that. Well, we did prevail, fortunately. We were able to demonstrate that actually they were emitting in the middle of the night, and we had to film. Uh, we had a camera that was put on top of the Sheraton, what was Hotel Albuquerque, it was called Sheraton at the time, and showed that the industry was releasing its emissions in the middle of the night, and you can see this brown plume over the community. It, uh, there were not lawsuits, there were some settlement agreements as a result of this for health and welfare. Not only that, they were dumping their industrial waste into unlined pits, which we discovered as well. So it contaminated the groundwater with formaldehyde and benzene for a quarter of a mile. Um, these are the these are the things that frustrate communities. Is that if there's an opportunity to be proactive, so that you don't have to turn around and clean. there's there was you know millions of dollars in cleanup. Of course, the sawmill is a good example of a redevelopment area. It got cleaned up. There was a lot of brownfields money that came in from the federal government after the after the contamination. So, if there's an opportunity for us to be proactive in protecting our groundwater, you know we need to be. We need to do something about it. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you, Commissioner Valley. Two, two comments briefly, if I, if I may. Um, first is that all of the all of the money that's coming into the state treasury right now comes from the Permian Basin for the most part, and the San Juan Basin it doesn't come from the Rio Grande Basin because there's no oil and gas production. So if you prohibit oil and gas fracking, or you put on a moratorium to look to look into the situation in more detail, you're not really causing any money to stop coming into the coffers of the state of New Mexico, are you? Okay? What you are doing is being proactive to make sure that that kind of fracking, they do that in the middle Rio Grande Basin, like they're doing in the Permian Basin, that's pretty significant, significant, and it's gonna cause problems. Okay, so and as far as being proactive, I wanna compliment you for being proactive because what, what you're doing now is you, you've got a group within the Middle Rio Grande Basin Consortium here 
that's looking at this issue to come up with guidelines for what we do for an oil and gas ordinance and what, what you would recommend. And all I'm trying to say is that there's not enough of the technical stuff that I know about and the oil and gas stuff that I know about that's being considered in that draft. And you really got to take a close look at this because it's crucial. It's crucial to the future of half the population of New Mexico. And I, I also want to point out that I know Commissioner Howell from working closely with him in Sandoval County, that if Sandoval County allows hydraulic fracking up there and they do contaminate the aquifer or they do cause earthquakes, it's going to flow downhill, just like that Rio Rancho study in 2013 showed it will. So that what you pass in, in Albuquerque or Bernalillo County, and it doesn't impact Sandoval County or Rio Rancho, the only way to work is to make it right is to work together to make sure that everybody's protected. And that's what this group does. That's why I'm re I really appreciate being allowed to, to come in and talk to you about this. Yes, uh, Member Torres. Mr. Phillips, Don, thank you again so much because I think you have a a rare ability to really present a lot of a lot of information in a real clear fashion. Um, and I know that I was one of the people that had asked the Council of Governments to look at this because, again, as a small municipality, I don't have the staff or the budget to be able to, frankly, do what you've done for us. Um, and it's given me so much to think about that I had already been thinking about, but even more. And, and I think um, in flipping this open real quickly, looking at that oil and gas ordinance template, um, from my point of view, um, that's our next step locally. And, and certainly um, understand that we want to move forward carefully, but as um, the commissioner said, we need to be proactive. And I think what scares me the most is if you have a, a situation like you described with the sawmill, there is the opportunity to um, address the contamination. What scares me most about all this is if we contaminate our aquifer, I don't know if there's any way to address that. Once that door is open, I'm just not sure how that would even begin to start happening. And the other part of it is even though we're talking about you know, the Albuquerque metro area, if this became uh, uninhabitable, um, what does that do to the rest of the state? I mean, it's just inconceivable to imagine the state surviving without the metro area here. And again, I know that we have to face risk each and every day, everything we do from the minute we get up. Uh, but for me, there's no question that risking uh, our lives, our future here, our water, um, it doesn't matter how much revenue could potentially come into my community or the state or any place else with the kind of risk that would be associated with it. So again, I um, I thank you for your really concise, clear, and I, I took a note of the time. And you're amazing in terms of sticking to the minute almost uh, and getting all the information across. Do we said I had to do this? Uh, so, so you're like the rest of, our, of us mayors as you learn to take orders well. <laughs> But again, I appreciate all the information you've given us, the concise, clear fashion that's been presented. And uh, honestly, especially that the template, because for a lot of us, I know the smaller municipalities, we need that help. And obviously we have uh, our work ahead of us, but this has taken us forward in my mind, um, maybe a couple of years, if, if not more. So thank you. You're welcome, and thank you for mentioning that. And I do want to compliment the Sandoval County people who were behind what we put together, you know, way last year. And and uh, the other thing I want to mention, just to be clear with everybody, is that I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat, and I'm not a member of any environmental organization. Okay, and I did this as a consulting work as a geologist, as if I had been paid for it, but I'm not charging anybody anything. And you can take it and do with it what you want, and I would, I would encourage you to have it verified 
by other technical people who don't have a special interest, okay? And really look closely at it, and I think you're going to find that the facts are, are there. And it's the truth. And one of my favorite quotes is, is a great thing about science is it's the truth whether you believe it or not. Member Hunt. Hey, um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the primary reasons that after two years of engagement with our citizens in San Luis County that this didn't move forward was because of the concern that this is not just a San Luis County issue. It's uh, a regional issue, at least, maybe even a state issue that we should be looking at um, the potential impact on our livelihood, our economies, et cetera. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I just want to uh, reassure you all that, uh, that we still have the guidelines are in the work, the work in process, and I want to make sure everybody understands we are not developing an ordinance. It's going to be guidelines to, to help different governments in our region uh, to, to develop their own ordinances. And so uh, it, it's a work in progress right now. We're still taking input. And so we appreciate your report. And, um, and we will make sure that the, the technical team um, gets this information and uh, considers that. Hopefully. Anything further? Thank you very much. Appreciate that.